Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name's Brian, and in this video, we're going to be going over some of the tactics and general play style of the Greyjoys in general. You know, they they seem to be crashing upon the shores of the U.S. and uh, you know, with 1.7 on the horizon of becoming like a reality not that i know when it's going to happen it's just got to be soon because i imagine when the Greyjoys hit that's when cool mini or not is going to kind of push forward the rest of the 1.7 update i figured it would be a good time to start talking about what the Greyjoys are bringing and it seems like it's also the best faction to kind of start the talk with since they seem to really be designed where they're not going to need a faction update pack. You know, the, the starter box comes with the 1.7 rules, so I imagine the rules within them on the cards or on the unit cards are going to be the rules that we kind of see carry forward into the 1.7 era of A Song of Ice and Fire. So let's dig into what it is the Greyjoys actually do on a little bit more of an in-depth scale, probably more than what I've done so in the past, you know, ever. So when we talk about faction identity, in order to try, kind of drill down on it, there's a lot of different facets in this game that play into it. You know, we've got the tactics deck, we've got the commanders, the units, the attachments, the NCUs. All of those things kind of coalesce into this one ball of faction identity. So I think that the core of it, the roots of faction identity, really comes from the tactics deck. When you kind of remove everything else from the game and take it in its own separate parts, of course faction or, or uh, attachments and NCUs on their own don't really define faction identity all that well. The units can, you know, there's a lot of parts of faction identity that can be drawn from just looking at the units themselves, but I feel like the tactics deck minus commanders really drills down on what the core identity of a faction should be, and that's where we're going to start with the Greyjoys. Before we dig into the tactics deck on the Greyjoys, because of course that's where I'm going to start, I wanted to kind of give just a small primer to what I think the Greyjoys kind of come to the game with, like what's their angle. And I feel like the Greyjoys are, they're a little bit of a glass cannon, they don't have extremely survivable units, but the uh, the big deal for them is that they are an attrition-based faction. And, you know, the, the Baratheons kind of existed as one of the original attrition factions in that uh, they used a lot of their stats to survive an attrition that, you know, your opponent just had a hard time cleaving through all these three-plus defense saves. And their attacks weren't all that great, but they were frequent. And I know that's going to change when the addition shifts over, or not addition shifts over, but when the update hits for the new version. But the Greyjoys, in general, when I think about what it is they do, they fight hard and often, and they can survive through pulling wounds back and kind of averting danger in, in terms of death or bringing back units. So I think they really do kind of play the attrition game on the more pressure side instead of sustainable attrition. They have a little bit of sustain in them, but I think the Greyjoys are going to get whittled down quite easily. So the way that they end up shifting attrition is by making themselves more effective as you're killing your opponent's stuff and they try to last the long game by healing up those units so they want to try and get them to stick around so it's all about making your opponent's stuff less effective through wounds and making your stuff more effective over the long run with good attack stats getting better as you kill stuff and trying to sustain through just bodies so let's go ahead and dive into the tactics deck and see why I... Well, it's not see why, but more like this will be kind of the justification for why I think the way I do when it comes to the Greyjoys. So starting off, the first card we come across is We Do Not Sow. This triggers when a friendly NCU claims a zone, then you can replace that zone's effect with one friendly combat unit performs one attack action. If an opponent controls the wealth zone, that unit also restores one wound and then plus one wound for each one of its destroyed ranks. So there's a lot of interesting things going on with this card right away. First of all, I do not particularly appreciate cards that re have replacement effects on the NCU board. There are definitely some exceptions to these, but by and large, most of the ones that exist out there, at least in current 1.6 state, are not ones that I really care about all that much. You know, you're, it, it's a very resource-intense card. You end up uh, taking an activation of an NCU, 
and if that NCU happens to have a replacement effect on their or, or effect on their own, uh, they don't get to utilize that, which is you know kind of the point for bringing some of those NCUs that have replacement effects is that you want to use them. And then on top of that, um, not only giving away the zones effect and the NCU's purpose for being in the in the list, you're also losing a tactics card over it. So it's a resource intense. Uh, thing or a resource inten intense exchange to be able to play something like we do not so or any other tactics card that replaces an effect on the on the NCU board. However, this card seems to be particularly powerful in that some of the Greyjoy NCUs end up not having to do replacement effects uh, when they take zones. Sometimes they're really just kind of doing things in addition to. Sometimes they don't do anything at all when they or when they take the zone. They just kind of have this weird existence outside of the NCU board. So that's not so much of a sacrifice for this particular card in general. But on top of that, instead of doing something like how the Baratheons, at least in 1.6, had a couple cards where it was like, you get to do these things that maybe aren't so impactful, but they're cool and they do something other than just zapping someone for a panic test. This gives you an extra, essentially, activation for a combat unit. If something's engaged, they can just go ahead and fight, or if they're a shooting unit, they can go ahead and take some shots if they want to. And that's extremely powerful on its own. Not to mention, if your opponent ends up starting to claim the wealth zone, uh, you end up getting this extra buffer to it, and it just kind of, like, really kind of showcases some of the things that the Greyjoys are really known, well, at least not known for, because no one's really known for anything right now at this point, especially Greyjoys, other than being extremely late on arrival. But, uh, you know, they, it, I think it kind of plays into what I think their overall strategy is. The next card off the top is What is Dead May Never Die. So this triggers when a friendly unit is destroyed. That unit is not destroyed, but instead remains in play with D3 wounds. Attach this card to that unit until the end of the game. While attached, when that unit performs an action before resolving the action, that unit suffers D3 wounds unless you control the combat zone. So this is another card that kind of really works into this attritional mindset and working off of this glass cannon aspect that the Greyjoys have. Your units will die because they are not as survivable as others unless you're putting a lot of effort into trying to heal them, which kind of, you know, works into this we do not sow stuff where if your opponent ends up taking the coin zone because you as Greyjoys probably will want to heal often, they kind of get penalized for it. But with what is dead may never die, you... If you're not really up on the healing game or your opponent gets a really big smack into you and is trying to take advantage of some of that uh, peace trading, uh, you end up stopping them from doing that at the very low price of just kind of taking wounds whenever you activate. And with uh, all of the healing that's involved in the or, or, or is available to the Greyjoys, the... Uh, this, this card shouldn't really be that big of an issue for you. I'm not 100% sure if Tycho is going to stay the way stay the same way that he is right now, but I imagine he's going to be somewhat similar. Um, if he has that still kind of thing where once per game at the start of the turn he can just like bet, throw five wounds back on the table, that'll be a really big deal for them. But outside of that, Greyjoy NCUs and other cards in general just kind of have this like built-in healing aspect to them so what is dead may never die just means that if your opponent is trying to they're trying to feel like they're getting a really big advantage by putting a lot of effort into taking out a unit you can just instead say no this isn't going to happen and i'm going to keep this unit back i do have a, a mitigable risk by saying that if i don't control the combat zone which i will often want to control um, i'm going to start taking wounds now your opponent's also going to want to take that zone too because if you give the Greyjoys the combat zone often, uh, it, it's not going to be a good time in with having things like We Do Not Sow and uh, other options available to the army. But I think that What Is Dead May Never Die is going to turn out to be one of those cards where people just... It, it's one of the things that's going to tilt them the most when they feel like they've, they're starting to push the advantage and kind of take the game back, and then you just say, no, this is kind of like a, the combat version of... Um, cunning ploy you know it's, it's just going to be like no you can't do this you can't take this unit away from me the next tactics card that we get up in the Greyjoy deck is probably the excel person's 
card from hell. There are so many if statements on this thing that I think you would just go bonkers trying to program it. But uh, it's called the Kraken's Wrath, and this triggers when a friendly unit is performing a melee attack before rolling their attack dice. If you control the combat zone, the attack gains precision. If an opponent controls the combat zone, this attack may re-roll any attack dice and gains precision. If you control the wealth zone, the defender becomes panicked, and if your opponent controls the wealth zone, the defender becomes vulnerable. So this is another unique aspect for the Greyjoys that I don't think we've really seen as an overarching thing or an ever-present thing in other factions where the Greyjoys really like having certain zones. You know, it's always every faction kind of likes having zones based on the tactics deck. And for the Greyjoys, it comes down to the combat zone and the wealth zone. But they're also one of the very first factions that kind of really punishes you for taking things away from them that they want. So within this card itself, it's it's always good. You know, there's never a bad time for it, especially in the late part of the turn when most NCUs have started to claim things. Your opponent's going to want to take the combat zone, of course, because they want to get those extra attacks. And your opponent will also want to take the wealth zone because you as a Greyjoy player are going to be swinging a lot and doing a ton of damage. And they also don't want you healing back up because that's kind of your primary way of making sure that you get to the end game. So if you happen to have taken the combat zone yourself uh, to gain that activation advantage or the, the, the attritional advantage through combat, you just, you'll still get precision. So on sixes to hit, you, you won't, uh, you'll ignore the armor saves, which are, or defense saves, which is pretty good. But if your opponents decide to try and take that advantage away from you, not only do you get that precision, but you also get to reroll. And if you're hitting pretty well based on what kind of units you're taking or what their pillage situation is, uh, rerolls are amazing with precision because if you're hitting on twos, you're just going to be able to fish for sixes and be pretty reliable on making sure you get more out of what you did instead of less. For the wealth zone, if you're taking it and panicking the enemy, cool beans, maybe your Harlow Reapers are swinging and then that's going to do a lot of work for you. Um, but if it's any other unit, and even Reapers too, if your opponent's taking that away from you, they become vulnerable. So all the work that they've put in trying to heal the unit that you're trying to get into kind of gets erased because the vulnerable token is going to make them re-roll those successful saves and that should give you a lot more advantage. So the Kraken's Wrath is really just like a great example of what the Greyjoys are trying to do and really plays into the strategy that they're bringing to the table. Next up we have the Iron Price. This triggers at the start of a friendly turn. You target one friendly combat unit and remove any number of pillage tokens from that unit and choose one of these modes for each token removed. That unit restores two wounds, and this particular one can be selected multiple times. That unit gains plus one speed and may re-roll their charge distance dice this turn. And then finally, that unit attacks with its highest attack dice value this turn. So the pillage mechanic for the Grey Joys is really cool. It's like every time they wipe out a rank, they get a pillage token, and you have some ways to and to add some to those units um, through other methods, right? Through NCUs or whether it's the archers that are spreading them around. But the the thing that ends up happening after a while is that there's I always feel like there's this you know economy that I that I build on where like you know if I wipe out a rank and I have pillage tokens on me, I'm not really gaining anything out of it. So the, the, that extra ability kind of falls off. It's not really that relevant anymore. But the iron price lets you kind of shift some of those off to get some really big benefits. And restoring a bunch of wounds can make sure that that unit maybe is swinging enough dice to where they can uh, wipe another rank off of someone and make sure that they're getting those pillage tokens. You can ensure that your unit's getting in really early with something like uh, the charge distance and getting the re-rolling a charge dice and getting an extra inch to that charge distance. Um, you know, making sure that your maybe your ironborn archers have shot someone down, put a token on someone who's a little bit more aggressive, something like the reavers, and then they can charge in and you know do all their work with their pillage tokens and sundering, or just being able to take something that maybe has taken some wounds and you haven't been uh, able to heal it up, just spending one of those pillage tokens that it's had for a while and maybe might not be getting the most use out of anymore, and just swinging on full dice instead of whatever their last column is, which in the Greyjoys, the last column for most of their attacks is not all that great. So I think the Iron Price really 
feeds into this idea that the Greyjoys really like playing this aggressive, attritional game. And if they can't attrition that way because their survivability isn't all that good, they can at least then heal themselves up so they can try and swing the game back in their favor. I think that the Iron Price is a really strong card that people might not overtly realize the power of because pillage tokens are really important to the army but when you're removing them to just then add them back after when you've gotten some extra combat capabilities it is really really strong and can push forward your ultimate objective which is to wipe your opponent's stuff off so that you can make sure you're scoring objectives and they aren't threatening you the next card up in the Greyjoy dance is probably one of the more nuanced ones that'll take a little bit of time to get used to but this one is finger dance this triggers at the start of a friendly turn. You can target one friendly combat unit and attach this card to them until the end of the game. While attached, the attacking or, well, while attached, when attacking enemies with the same or fewer remaining ranks before rolling the attack dice, the defender becomes vulnerable. When an enemy with the same or more remaining ranks attacks this unit before rolling the attack dice, this unit becomes vulnerable. So this card kind of turns a unit into almost like a cleanup crew, which is one of the things that I think the Greyjoys, like, they, they enjoy doing, of course, because they want to push this combat pressure on the opponent. And if you have a unit that has finger dance on it, it means that you have the initial unit going in that doesn't have finger dance on it, kind of whittling them down a little bit, kind of making it easier for the other unit to come in. And then the unit that has finger dance on it can go in, do some damage, make sure they're vulnerable, and get their pillage tokens and push that combat advantage through this card. Now as the game progresses, your opponent might be able to set themselves up in ways to where they can go after a finger dance unit and make them vulnerable, which is not super great for something like Greyjoys because they do not have the greatest armor saves in the universe. So unless you're looking at something like Iron Makers with a bunch of pillage tokens on them or something like that. But uh, in general, I really do like Finger Dance as kind of a way to like put it on a unit of Reavers. So like something like the Ironborn Archers can take some pot shots into something, maybe whittle it down before they get in. And then when they charge, they're Sundering, they have Vulnerable, and they're able to you know, make sure that they're getting their own pillage tokens, not just from the Reavers but, or, or from the Ironborn Archers, but from their own attacks as well. You just have to make sure that your opponent doesn't kind of recognize what you're trying to do with this unit and respond in a way to make sure that they're going after this with their extremely survivable units that they know will get there. Now this is another thing that makes kind of the Greyjoys so elegantly designed because they would want to be taking the coin zone to make sure that they heal a unit to make sure that they are above uh, the remaining ranks for the, uh, the finger dance unit or at or above, sorry, and, uh, you know, the, the Greyjoy deck in general kind of punishes your opponent for doing something like that, so I think Finger Dance is a really cool card, if for anything, just to try and bait your opponent into taking that zone to start healing up, but it really does kind of still play into this idea with that the Greyjoys have that they like to put the pressure on and don't mind sacrificing their own units to do it. Next up, we have the card Raiding Call. This triggers when a Greyjoy infantry unit activates. You remove up to four models and up to one pillage token from one other friendly Greyjoy infantry unit within long range. You then restore that many wounds to this unit, and if that unit has pillage, you place the removed pillage token on this unit as well. If any player happens to control the wealth zone for this one, one friendly unit with pillage gains one pillage token. So this is a lot like one of the Free Folk cards that we've seen previously, and uh, it's really important to recognize that this card does not work with neutrals at all. It's Greyjoy specific, so you need two Greyjoy units to make this thing work. So it kind of plays back into this attritional sense, right, where we're trying to take things away from our own units to buff up other ones that might need it a little bit more. And, uh, you know, there are a couple units in the Greyjoy army that don't really care too much about missing one of their early ranks, you know, like the, the trappers and the archers. So you can end up taking units like that and making sure that they can still kind of buff up the units when the lines have kind of crashed and it's hard for them to start shooting. Because if you start shooting into your, 
engagements with Greyjoys, chances are you're going to be failing panic tests because they aren't really great at that unless you're kind of trying to mitigate that through some of the other commanders or other things that we might be taking. But being able to kind of take a unit that's kind of just sitting on an objective and doing what they're needing to do and not really needing to get into the business and then buffing up one of the units in terms of wounds that's already in the mix is a really big deal. Uh, not to mention you're going to be pulling pillage. You could be pulling pillage tokens from that unit. The likelihood of this is kind of low in my opinion because one of the units you would be pulling from doesn't get pillage tokens at all and that's the archers. And then the other unit is going to be the trappers and... I don't know how regularly they're going to be getting their pillage tokens because of their bad hit stat and their low attacks. Uh, I just don't know how frequent that's going to happen for them. But if any player, not just you, but you, if your opponent ends up controlling the coin zone as well, which when you play this, it's going to kind of... It, it, the chances are likely that someone's going to be owning this zone. You can put one pillage token on any unit. It doesn't even have to be one of the units that's selected for one of the two. It doesn't have to be one of the two units that's selected for raiding call. You can just do this wherever. And I think this is a huge deal for this card where you can start affecting so many different things on the table. Like if we look at the, you know, in, in quotes, the, inef the inefficiency of something like we do not sow, Raiding Call has so much efficiency to it because you're taking a unit that isn't doing a lot, putting models back in a unit that is doing a lot, and then if somebody has that coin zone, likely someone will early, you'll be able to get more efficiency by putting more pillage tokens on something that actually needs it. So I think that this card synergizes so well with the faction, and it's going to really be one of those ones where people start when they see it played, they're going to be like, this is going to be a terrible outcome, even though it doesn't really feel like it on the front end because we've only seen thing this kind of card in Free Folk before where kind of upsetting the ranks isn't really a big deal. But in Greyjoys, it's going to be huge, and this card could almost, I feel like in my mind's eye, it feels like it could set yourself up to kind of switch a game completely and rubber band back into it. So the final card up in the Greyjoy Tactics deck is Bless with Stone, Bless with Steel. This triggers when a friendly combat unit activates. You target one enemy engaged with that unit, and for each one of that enemy's destroyed ranks, this unit restores two wounds. If you control the coin or the combat zone, you restore one wound or remove one condition token from this unit for each one of the zones you control. So this card is just ridiculously great. I, I think that what it ends up doing is it, it pushes again this concept that the Greyjoys like to attrition through combat prowess and their survivability is only held up by restoring wounds instead of their actual stats. You get to just automatically restore wounds for each rank that your opponent has down. And in the late game, this is going to be huge. It could really rubber band a unit back into being effective from being, you know, not all that effective. Because no matter what, if you... Well, not no matter what, but if your opponent has two ranks down, you're filling a unit back up. And if we think about something like what is dead may never die, playing Bless with Stone, Bless with Steel on them when you're already kind of in the mix could really get them back into the fight and not worry about taking that D3. Now, the controlling the coin or the combat zone, typically you're going to control one of these two because early game your opponent's going to take one of them away from you and then you're probably going to be taking the other one because you're going to be healing early or fighting early. It's just the way I feel like the Greyjoys are going to work out. And that's not only, not only does it have the potential to get you back another wound, but if your opponent's using things like, uh, like condition tokens to try and lessen the effectiveness of your army through something like Weaken, this is your one chance to try and remove those that's just innate within the tactics deck. So Bless with Stone, Bless with Steel, I think is another one of these really great rubber band cards that the Greyjoys have, and kind of really work into this idea that the Greyjoys can kind of control the tempo of the game. And I think that's just another thing that uh, really goes into one of their core strategies, is the Greyjoys really do feel like they can really crank down on managing the tempo of the game. So to elaborate on 
my last statement about the Greyjoys being a tempo-based faction. Well, I didn't really say they were a tempo-based faction. I just said they can really control the tempo of the game. Um, I kind of think about the Greyjoys in a lot of the ways that I think about the Baratheons in that Baratheons innately control the tempo of the game in that no matter how much combat force your opponent puts forward, the Baratheons kind of mitigate that by not just taking a bunch of extra attacks, but mostly because their armor saves are really great. The, the Baratheons are hard to break. They also heal. Their combat output isn't so phenomenal on the front end, but as the game goes on, they end up putting out more attacks and can survive better, make your stuff worse, and that's how they do it. But with the Greyjoys, they kind of control the tempo in a different way, where the Baratheons slow down the tempo of the game and say the attrition is going to be very slow and we're going to have this sustained battle. The Greyjoys control the tempo in a very quick way. They're like, you can whittle down my stuff easily, I'm going to whittle down your stuff a lot more easily, and I'm going to be able to continue doing this and keeping this very aggressive pace during the game because I can keep my units healed up and make sure that they're effective. And if you try to stop me by taking the combat zone and trying to become more combat effective, or taking the coin zone to try and become more attritionally effective through healing, I can stop that and punish you for it. So the Greyjoys just kind of own this tempo of the game. And I think when a lot of people look at like what the Greyjoys actually are in like fluff or lore or whatever, you know, that really doesn't feel like that's the way they do things. I think sometimes the Greyjoys kind of feel a little bit more haphazard, like they're kind of the hillbillies of uh, the A Song of Ice and Fire universe. But in the game, Coolmini or Not has done, or Coolmini or Not's developers have done such an amazing job of taking the Greyjoys and really making them an extreme force that's unique to A Song of Ice and Fire in general. I mean, the Starks are all about maneuver tactics and hitting really early, and the Lannisters are super controlly, not even in the same realm as Greyjoys in terms of playability. I think the neutrals kind of border a little bit on some of the things the Greyjoys can do, but they don't lean into it so hard because they are kind of like the Swiss army knife of the game. And, uh, you know, the other factions kind of speak for themselves, like the, the Targaryens just kind of do their thing. You know, they're fast, sometimes they're survivable, you just like, it depends, they're kind of like a hodgepodge. They're like the, the potpourri of the Song of Ice and Fire, whereas like Baratheons are really stalwart and they grind the game down because they want you to sandpaper them with basically an etch-a-sketch, you know, nothing really abrasive. But the Greyjoys themselves, they have this really fast-paced game style where they sacrifice a lot but gain as they go along. And I think that's going to make them a really interesting faction to play and very attractive to others, not to mention their aesthetic is really great uh, in the game in terms of the models and their, their whole core concept in, in terms of what the... the in, in terms of how Cool Mean or Not has sold them to us is really great as well. And uh, in terms of, like, what comes next for talking about Greyjoys, because they are the only thing that exists right now that is almost fully flushed out in the 1.7 update... I plan on talking more about Commanders. So far, the channel's already done a video on Balon Greyjoy and a video on Victarian Greyjoy. We've got a couple more left, so if you want to leave a comment below on which one you'd like me to talk about next, I'd be more than happy to do that. I do have uh, some Ironborn Reaver painting tutorials that are going to be coming out soon, so that's going to be super cool because we're doing a lot of cool techie stuff with that. And then as this tactics discussion kind of comes about with the Greyjoys, we might find more of that coming out in the Commander videos as we start to talk about the units more. But, um, you know, I'm really interested in trying to dig really deep into the Greyjoys right now because they are... They, they kind of had this unprecedented release, which is kind of what I think the new release strategy for Cool Mini or Not is going to be, where they release a big block of stuff all at once for a faction, so we don't get these problems that we had in the early days where, like, yeah, you only have your starter box and maybe one thing that comes out in a month and a half, or a month and a half later, so you kind of get to be the low man on the totem pole until... You know, you have some more releases flushed out. You know, think about what Baratheons looked like on their release date compared to what they look like now. They have, like, three different faction identities identities within themselves, and it's a totally different landscape. But with the Greyjoys, we get so many options right on the front end uh, when they come out that uh, there's just so many things to absorb. And I want to make sure that as I get much more involved with A Song of Ice and Fire content creation... 
that I'm trying to meet the needs of the community in general because I really do like talking about the, the tactics development and strategies involved with factions like this and I think the Greyjoys really do have a lot of room to explore you know what do they do not not just do we have like three attachments and a couple NCUs and a couple commanders from the starter but we already have a heroes box we already have a bunch of attachments from that and other units that kind of shift the way that the Greyjoys end up approaching the game so I think it's going to be so cool and it's extremely exciting and I really look forward to seeing or hearing from all of you in the community to see what I should talk about next or what you're looking forward to the most for the Greyjoy faction in A Song of Ice and Fire, the miniatures game.